previewing this next upcoming week for Gonzaga. It's a huge one. Uh, Central Michigan, the Chippewas. Um, we're just going to brush over that one really quickly and talk about UCLA. That UCLA game, um, 43rd time in the history of college basketball that in the regular season, number one meets number two, Gonzaga obviously being number one. Um, and I believe it's the only time that both of those two teams have been true West Coast teams. So that's awesome to see the West Coast basketball is getting a little bit of uh, excitement, a little bit more interest, a little bit of uh, coverage um, because it's well-deserved what those two teams uh, did a season ago, but what they're also uh, seemingly looking to do this year. So I think some of the big things for, for the UCLA game for Gonzaga to really um, focus in on and, and be prepared for is UCLA is going to guard you. Any Mick Cronin team going back to when he was at Cincinnati, they're going to be terrific on the defensive end, which is no different this year. Um, so Gonzaga's got to you know get stops, push when you can get easy transition buckets, take advantage of it. Um, but then get into their continuity ball screen offense, uh, which has been pretty good at times this year. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see some some lineups where they have the three guards, Bolton, Nemhart, and, and Nolan Hickman in there together, where you've got three ball handler decision makers um, to really kind of put the defense uh, back on their heels. But the reason I think it's so important is because to, to get that ball moving side to side is because UCLA is so good defensively you got to put them in positions where they're going to break down, make a mistake, and they're not going to make a mistake on the strong side on the initial entry. It's going to have to get moved a second or a third time to, to put them in more opportunities to make that mistake. And then I think defensively, um, Ju Zhang's gotten off to a nice start this year. Uh, that's going to be interesting to, to see who picks up that uh, assignment. I think Haquez, uh, Gonzaga has to ma match his effort and energy. Um, on the glass as well as in transition and being aware of him on cuts uh, because he's really opportunistic with, with how he gets off uh, baskets off of back cuts, uh, flashes in the paint, different things like that. Um, so that's going to be a fun one to watch. And then everybody's going to be excited and looking forward to the Duke matchup on Friday. Um, you've got a matchup that the game has been sold out almost since the day or the week the tickets went on sale. Everybody's excited because – uh, Duke is back from a season ago. They were they struggled. Um, they're back, top ten. Paulo Banchero and Chet Holmgren, the two best freshmen in the country. There's going to be a lot of talk about these two guys. Who's the number one pick in the NBA draft? Well, the way I see it right now, there's really neither one of them has distanced themselves. I think so much of it is going to depend on who has that number one pick and what their roster makeup looks like. Um, because I can't, I don't think you can go wrong with either one. I think. Chet is probably more versatile. His scoring numbers aren't going to just jump out at you as where Banchero is going to have the opportunity, I think, where his scoring numbers are going to jump out and, and look uh, much higher uh, than Holmgren's will at the course of the year. Well, I mean, they're both unbelievable, terrific players. Um, I think it's going to be interesting to see, you know, the, the point guard matchups for Duke versus Gonzaga. I think Gonzaga's got that advantage. I know Keel's had a, a nice game earlier in the season. Um, I, I believe it was against Kentucky in the Champions Classic. But when all is said and done, this is going to be a high-scoring, up-and-down game. Uh, I think you're going to see both teams um, at least into the mid-80s, probably maybe into the 90s. It's going to be a close game, but I think Gonzaga is going to prevail. And if they get through this week, Central Michigan, UCLA, and Duke, you're going to start to hear some chatter about Gonzaga going undefeated. Because if they get through this week, it's looking like a real possibility. Before we move on to the next topic, let me tell you guys a little bit about our partners over at Bet Rivers Sportsbook. If you haven't signed up with Bet Rivers yet, Now's the time because they are offering a $250 match bonus for your first deposit. But what sets them apart is that they require just one playthrough to turn your bonus into cash money. With their new Rush Pay instant approval, withdrawing your winnings is safer, more secure, and more reliable. With basketball season tipping off, get in on the action by going to betrivers.com today or by downloading the Bet Rivers iOS app. Must be 21 years or older. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. 
Another episode of the Bulldog Broadcast with myself, your host, Dan Dickow, for the Field of 68 Media Network. It's a big week. It's Thanksgiving week here in the States for our guest. Hopefully he'll find a way to get Thanksgiving in some way, shape, or form because he's playing professionally in Finland right now. Excited to hear about his experiences, not only at Gonzaga, but also his first stop. The Texas A&M transfer, Admon Gilder. Thanks for joining, Admon. How is life? Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's pretty good right now. You know, I can't, don't have any complaints. You know, I'm uh, doing what I love, being a professional athlete and uh, playing overseas basketball at the moment. So a lot of times when I have former players on, I ask them about some of their, you know, positive or maybe negative experiences because people don't realize just how difficult sometimes it is to go over seas and, and play you 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 see the excitement of playing overseas and, and you get to do what you love but it can be difficult have you experienced any just crazy out there stories that you would share with somebody and they just shake their head and don't believe you um i really haven't had that too many you know those crazy stories um other than it's like really really cold here you know but you know i think that's just something that you can't control. And I kind of knew that, you know, going into it firsthand. But other than that, I've had not had too many uh, negative stories, like I said, and um, I've been enjoying it so far. So you're in Finland. You told me before we got to recording that uh, the Spokane winters kind of prepared you for this. You're a Texas guy, Dallas, if I'm if I'm correct. What was the hardest part about a Spokane winter for you? Just the, the unknown, you know, some days, you know, it's always cold there in Spokane, but you never know exactly when it was going to snow. And me being a Texas guy, you know, I probably probably see snow once a year. And then going from Spokane, Washington, you know, seeing it maybe the whole entire uh, the whole entire winter and fall. So let's let's stay on the topic of the the state of Texas. Uh, Gonzaga starting to uh, really make some inroads recruiting Texas. We all know about Drew Timmy. Um, dominated the Texas Longhorns. Uh, you're from Dallas. You played at Texas A&M. What is it about Texas high school basketball players in your mind that suits them really well to come to Gonzaga? Um, you know, I think I've had this conversation with a couple of my friends. You know, sometimes even though we're a big state, I think we kind of get overshadowed by the football. You know, um, even I went to A&M, you know, sometimes – um, the basketball team got overshadowed by by the football team, which, you know, which is no problem. You know, they were always so good, always coached by, you know, high level coaches. But I think the one thing about Texas guys is we have all, all the same type of grit. We all play with the same type of passion. And uh, you kind of seeing that from Drew, you know, even though Drew ended at Gonzaga, I think he's always been one of those guys that's been under the radar, you know, in the state of Texas. But now seeing him at Gonzaga and seeing him, you know, shine so well, you know, just gives hope for all the Texas guys that, you know, from the past and also the upcoming, you know, guys that's going to play college basketball in the future. So tell us a little bit about Texas A&M, because I've, I've had a couple broadcast assignments there. That campus is enormous. I swear you could probably fit 50 Gonzaga campuses in the A&M campus. Give us a little bit of life of uh, an idea of what life is like at Texas A&M and then the adjustments you had to make for Gonzaga. Oh, a and was one of those, you know, those special places that I always call, you know, one of my second homes, you know, other than outside of Dallas at that moment. And uh, I had a great time. You know, I came in with one of the top three recruiting classes that was DJ Hogue, Tyler Davis, you know, a lot of Thomas. And, you know, crazy thing about it, we were all Dallas guys. And so uh, we all had set out an agenda to go, go to Texas A&M and, you know, kind of make it a basketball school because, you know, like I said, it's, uh, A&M has always been kind of known as a football school. And, um, you know, we wanted to win the national championship. And so uh, on the first day, you know, like you said, I realized how big the campus actually was. You know, I, I visited there, you know, prior going to, to committing to a and But when you're there and you're there uh, for the entire year, you realize how many students there are. I realized there was 75,000 kids. And I was just like, that's crazy, especially from a guy that went to high school and graduated with 90 kids. Yeah, that's uh, that's an enormous campus with 75,000 students. I, I remember even if you live off campus at Gonzaga, say you live on Sharper Mission, you have like a three minute walk to one of your classes. What was the longest walk you had to a class uh, at Texas A&M? I'm glad you said that because that was the next thing that I was going to get to. Since the campus is so big, 
you had to leave to go to class maybe two hours before because first of all, AM has this long train that will literally stop you from or have you being late to class. So sometimes you you I get in my car and then out of nowhere here comes the College Station train. Everybody that's that lives in College Station or have ever been to College Station kind of knows exactly what I'm talking about. But I think the longest is probably maybe walking was maybe an hour just because, um, you know, I made other stops at the nutrition center and stuff like that. But um, if I had to pinpoint just an ideal time, maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> so Texas barbecue is king down there. Did you ever find a barbecue place in Spokane that was worthy of a Texan making two trips to it? Oh, you know, it's crazy. I think um, I forgot the name of it, but it's actually a barbecue spot and a, a chicken spot that's in Spokane owned by a, a guy that's from Dallas, actually, and went to my high school. Wow. I, I, I wish I could remember the name of it, but, you know, I might have to get that back to you. But uh, there, that was that one spot. And then, uh, you know, like I said, we you know, I went to Gonzaga and I feel like, you know, we were a top tier school, the number one team in the country, and, you know. Um, the nutrition uh, um, and the staff did a really good job of feeding us, you know, after practice and even on the road. So you make the transition or the decision to grad transfer from A&M to Gonzaga. Were there any other schools that you were considering or once you realized that there was interest in Gonzaga for you, or was that it? Was it a done deal? Okay, I think I've maybe told the story maybe three times, you know, ever since that transition period. Um, ideally, I wanted to go back home and play for SMU. Uh, that was my uh, one of my real big goals just because I wanted to be closer to my family, you know, and uh, I thought it was a good idea just to be from a guy that's actually from Dallas. And then after that, you also got to remember that I came off injury, so I wasn't sure on, on how many schools that were going to recruit me. Um, I, like I said, I loved a and I really didn't want to leave it. But when I SMU came into the option, uh, you know, I thought it was a no brainer. And then out of a sudden, here comes here comes Texas Tech, here comes Gonzaga, here comes Kansas, here comes Virginia, who actually just won a national championship. And so I was really shocked and just blessed to be able to hear so many phone calls, you know, come my way after a really serious injury. Who was the coach that kind of headed up your recruiting? Because, you know, some programs, the head coach kind of is the, the pinpoint guy for a lot. Gonzaga kind of has a little bit of everybody recruiting coaches and then Coach Few uh, kind of comes in when necessary. How was it for you? Uh, it was mostly, uh, it was B-Mike. Uh, he did a really, really good job of me with the recruiting process. And I actually remember meeting him for the very first time in Dallas. He came out and uh, seen me. And I think he also made uh, a trip to go see Drew that uh, while he was in Dallas. And so, um the entire time we had mostly the, uh, our conversations and then you know that's when Tommy came in and that's when Coach Few came in and you know um, that's when I, I, I kind of figured that this is kind of like a, a family environment that I you know I want to be a part of. You mentioned Tommy Lloyd head coach of Arizona now they absolutely put a hurting on Michigan last night are you surprised that Arizona looks as good as they are with Tommy at the head head coaching reins? Not at all you know Tommy is a great coach and I'm happy to see it because every time that I've played Michigan, it's never went well. <laughs> so I'm really happy to know that. And, uh, you know, like like I said, Tommy is a really great coach. He was one of those guys at practice during the games who who's really, you know, big on details, who's big on recruiting. You know, I think a lot of people know that as well. And so uh, there's no surprise here. So I just, you know, hopefully they continue to have success that they're having. And, you know, I'm going to continue to start to follow them. What was the biggest adjustment for you in your game when you when you got to Gonzaga? I know that you you, you had to get healthy, um, but you were pretty good right off the bat for for GU. But in your eyes, what was the biggest adjustment? I think the biggest adjustment was the was the pace. Um, I think it also was just trying to figure out what coach you wanted, and uh, you know, especially as a transfer, you know, you don't want to do too much, but you also want to come in and, and still uh, show that what you're capable of doing, and then. Just one thing that surprised me how great the talent that we had, you know, and what's kind of crazy is that was a year that, you know, some people thought that we weren't going to be as good. And so, uh, you know, Tilly had just came back with, with great news for us. We had Ryan Woodridge, you know, who, who, who's been one of my good friends since Dallas. 
since the sixth grade. And so then you had Corey come back and then you had so many other pieces, Philip, Joel, Ayayi, and then you had Drew as well, Anton Watson. So it was just kind of unique to see us jail so fast when, you know, with so many different pieces coming off the team that they had that previous year. I love that you mentioned from how much talent you guys had. When you were going through that process of, of going from Texas A&M, looking at different schools, what was the biggest negative that other schools would say about Gonzaga? Because it, it might have worked when I was transferring from UW to Gonzaga. It might have worked even 10, 12 years ago. But I can't imagine any of the outside perceptions work anymore. What were some of the slights that other programs would have said about Gonzaga? I don't think there was too many negatives. I think there was just some of the things that they were pointing out that, you know, I think that everybody kind of, you know, is the, is the known, uh, is code, is really code in Spokane. I think that was, you know, one that I kept on hearing, um, you know, just about the WCC, about the talent going from SEC to the WCC and the competition level. Um, what else? And just being so far away from my daughter, I think that was one of the things that, you know, um, I had great people in my corner. And, you know, all the coaches that were recruiting me, you know, I'm not to say that they were saying that in a negative standpoint, but, you know, they were just giving me positive feedback is just trying to help me grow as a man and a father. What's your favorite memory of Coach Few? Do you have a great story? Okay, so I guess um, I got two. Mostly all his impressions that I've always had with other players. I think that's the most in uh, intriguing thing that I've always kind of, you know, to see how many Gonzaga players knows how he talks. And I think if you hear from any other player, they can tell you the exact same thing. And then I think the the most memorable memory that I have of him when he came, I think I can't remember after a win, he came in the locker room and did a handstand for probably about like 10 to 15 seconds. And I was just shocked because for a guy his age, but I know he's, you know, pretty agile because he's, He's probably one of the best pickleball players that I've seen, you know, while I was in Spokane. But I think just after that win in Washington, he came in the locker room and just, you know, did a handstand for about 15 seconds. And I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> give us, uh, if you've had a chance to watch this year's team, um, give give us a rundown of what you see. Oh, so I saw the Texas game. You know, I since the time difference, it's kind of hard to watch the games because if I have to stay up for a game, it's probably like three or four, five o'clock in the morning. I stood up for that night. And I, oh, I stayed up that night just to watch that game because of Gonzaga and then just some of the Texas guys that I know, like Andrew Jones and uh, Jalen Tyson and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, one of my A&M coaches is actually at Texas right now, Coach Eric Maligi. And so I knew it was going to be a really good one. And then just seeing the team firsthand, you know, like I said, I was happy to see that Drew got off to a really, really good start, especially from a guy that came back from after, you know, the, the last season. And I thought that, you know, he was going to have another big year because I've seen all the work that he put in this entire summer. Um, I got to see some of the new the new transfers. I've seen some of the younger guys who have a, a lot of talent. And I think they're gelling so quickly. And it reminds me of my year as well. And then just seeing seeing how big Chet is and see how he's altering shots and being able to do a little bit of everything. It's kind of impressive to see. You mentioned guys gelling together so quickly. What is it in your eyes allows Gonzaga to, to have grad transfers like yourself just kind of seamlessly move into the program and have an impact uh, and, and be a, a benefit to the culture as well? I think that's one of the things that you have to um, – come to realization when you first come to Gonzaga, that's those are the type of things that B. Mike was telling me, Tommy was telling me, Coach Hugh was telling me is that this is a family oriented, uh, um, you know, program. And so coming here requires you to put the family first and ideally, you know, um, and try to figure out the end goal, which is win the national championship. And so um, when you have guys that, you know, are, have good character, but also, you know, so super talented on the basketball court that that's willing to buy in and try to win the national championship, it's a no brainer. So you're in Finland right now playing, obviously um, you're focused on your career. What would the excitement level be like for you this year if Gonzaga wins the national title? Are you going to host a title game party for your teammates in Finland? What would that look like for you? Um, I think, uh, you know, 
I'll be first of all watching it, you know, I probably maybe even live streaming on my IG lives, you know, some of those things that, you know, we're able to do in this new generation. And then, you know, I still want to be able to have my own podcast, you know, the month's madness. I don't know if you heard about it a little bit last year, kind of started it. And then, you know, I, I honestly want to be able to fulfill that, that, um, that dream of continuing that and hopefully having, you know, better success with it. Well, before I let you go, share us a little bit more about the podcast, because I know a lot of Gonzaga fans listen to this one. They're always interested and excited to hear about what former players are up to. So share with uh, share with them how they can check out your podcast. Um, it, I'll be releasing mostly on my Instagram. I think that's the best way to kind of put it out. And uh, like like even last year, I had Corey Kiss would come on and just talk about a little bit about the team and, um, you know, how they're gelling and um, just – um, you know, their aspirations of trying to win a national championship. And so um, I want to have current players, you know, within college basketball, but also previous players that that played in March Madness and, you know, just talk about their favorite experiences, you know, um, like, you know, the UCLA game is coming up soon for Gonzaga. And so which is kind of cool is that me and Ryan was at that uh, at that final four. And so, um, you know, hopefully have Ryan Woodridge on there and just talk about, you know, his experience of seeing Gonzaga, you know, um, you know, trying to win a national championship. What is his favorite favorite memories? And like me just talking to him on the phone, um, I think he was just, you know, talking about what the just the alumni, you know, how many people that was actually at that game. And like we were able to see John Stockton, Adam Morrison, Zach Norvell, and some of those people that, you know, always, you know, like they said, once you're a Zag, you're always a Zag. And so uh, just having that support with you no matter what, I think would be, you know, one of the things that he'll talk about as well. Well, Admon, I appreciate it, and I'll leave you with this. You just said once a zag, always a zag, even if it's only for one year like you were. So I appreciate everything uh, that you did for that one year in Spokane. It sounds like Gonzaga had a big impact on you. Wish you a great success in your season in Finland, and uh, stay healthy and take care. Thank you. Thank you for having me.